Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 27 of the Spotlight Podcast, Success Stories for Veterans, where it is our job to break down and analyze titans from both the military and civilian communities to discover their tactics, their mindset, and their systems so that you can take those and apply them to your life and ultimately to your transition. Those titans range from New York Times bestselling authors to former heads of state to other divergent thinkers who are out there dominating their field by challenging conventional wisdom. And today we have Lisa Jaster. Now, Lisa kind of came to fame as a 2015 Ranger School graduate, but I discovered her work through her work with the Talent War Group. I invited her to come to the show because I was impressed by how many different projects she's working on while still maintaining a high level on each of those projects. On top of all of that, Lisa is still serving as a reserve engineer battalion commander. But one more interesting thing is Lisa actually walked away from a very lucrative career in Houston to take a risk pursuing the life that she actually wanted, that she had defined for herself. And that actually opened the opportunity for her to work on her number one project, hashtag delete the adjective. So how does Lisa do all this? Listen and find out. Lisa, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Carson. So Lisa, for, for people who might not be familiar with you, give me the, the Lisa backstory. Ooh, the Lisa backstory. So I am a class of 2000 West Point graduate and I became an engineer officer at that point in time and did seven years active duty. I had a five year break in service and missed the military, the tribe, the cult, the fraternity, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I missed it so much. Uh, and my husband was a reservist at the time and I was jealous of all of his drill weekends. Who would have thunk? <laughs> uh, so I got back in after a five-year break and became a reserve officer. And in 2015, the opportunity to go to ranger school was presented to whatever woman was either smart enough or dumb enough to volunteer at the time. I, of course, got goaded into raising my hand and once again volunteering for something that the army wanted me to do ended up being successful uh one of three women from the first integrated class of ranger school to actually graduate and then since then i've been a reservist and i've been working as a project manager uh first at shell oil company and now i work as the director of civil engineering for uh, an engineering firm out of new Braunfels called mns engineering and I'm simultaneously a battalion commander in the Army Reserve for an engineer unit. Yeah, so you're leaving, leading a pretty quiet life these days. It's like, oh yeah, and I have two kids. Yeah, there you go. All right, so you're so you're managing all of that, right? And that's Somehow. we could probably unpack that backstory for about four or five hours. But talk to me that five year break, and maybe if you could compare it to to where you are now. But that five year break when you walked out of the military, explain that like that first two you know, one to two years for me. So when I said I missed the cult slash fraternity, I say fraternity just because as someone who worked in a combat heavy engineer battalion, it's predominantly male. Um, and it would be impossible to compare it to a sorority. <laughs> but it it is a it is a cult. It is this this environment of fitting in all of the time and as I transitioned from the military to the civilian world, I didn't understand that when you move to a new location, it wasn't a PCS. You didn't have a sponsor when you got there. Nobody showed you the cool places to hang out for people who were in your demographic. Nobody grabbed you for a pickup game of basketball at 1700 when they realized you didn't have anybody locally. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really hard to transition and try to build that community that was automatic in the military. And I think that was the number one thing I missed. The, the neat thing I missed was I was, for the first time in my life, driving my own car. So I got to decide, did I, did I wanna go in the management route? Did I wanna go technical engineering? Did I wanna do, what did I wanna do when I grew up? We're in the army, there's lots of different paths. Mm -hmm. 
but they're paths, they exist. You either turn left or you turn right. And, and there's not a whole lot in between. Um, yeah, so I, I liked the variety, I liked the choice, but I definitely missed the organization and the culture of the military. And then I did find after being in South Korea, a base camp commander, I, I, you know, I did miss the fact that when I went to the dentist's office, I had to wait like everybody else. Yeah. So when you, when you got out and you clearly, you, you moved back in later, but what was the thought process as you were making those decisions? You know, okay, I'm not, it's not a path. I don't necessarily have to go left or right. I can go anywhere within the spectrum. How were you going about making decisions early on? I was really lucky that my husband, when he got out of the Marine Corps, he became a reservist before I even considered getting out of the Army. That was one of the reasons that we left the military as active duty Marine and active duty Army. It's very difficult to get co-located and get assignments together. So he got out of the Marine Corps and became a reservist. And then I got out of the Army later. Um, and he was still deployed when I found my first civilian job. So I had all the flexibility, which is, is really good. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is really hard because I was now just making all the decisions for our unborn children, our imaginary future together. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of weight on my shoulders. So that was difficult too, because in the military, you kind of have this path. And mm -hmm. with that path is a lot of certainty and job, job security. Uh, so uh, a lot of things leaned in for the first time where thinking about, okay, where we like to do a lot of stupid things. I do. I like to mountain climb. I like to jump out of airplanes. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to do all these things where you can get hurt. So, you know, medical facilities matter. Yeah. Uh, we knew we were going to have kids. So again, medical facilities, uh, schools, childcare, all these things started coming into play with my decision-making that I've never thought of before. But then it also was, hey, how do I find myself a community? I don't want to move into an area. I want to move into a community. I want a rec center. I want a, a pool where my kids can play with other kids. And, and how do I try to mimic some of these things I'm already missing after leaving the military, but I loved so much in a civilian path? So can we talk about... And, and I want to get back to this, this transition now. Can we talk about doing stupid things? What is it about stupid things that's, that's so important to you? <laughs> um, I am constantly surprised by what I can do. And it's not because I'm great. It's because somebody pushed me in that direction. Mm. And, I, you know, you've got, I'm a meme in the making. Like my whole <laughs> life is a meme. And you know the one that says, life begins outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I think I should have that tattooed somewhere because I was, I was a Lieutenant the first time I went snowboarding and I cracked a rib and it was awesome. It was wonderful. I went with a bunch of my soldiers on a religious retreat. And then I realized, well, I never in my life thought I could snowboard. Well, mm -hmm. what else can I do? And the army made me go out of a plane once. So my very first drill weekend back in the reserve, I had some buddies that I was drilling with say, hey, let's do civilian skydiving. I said, well, that sounds absolutely genius. And it's every time I do something like that, I realize that, wait a minute, I can do something I didn't think I could do. And now as a parent, I watch my children. We went to the Renaissance Festival yesterday. I've never been to a Renaissance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've never been to a Renaissance Festival in my life, but with COVID, it's outdoors. It's, mm -hmm. I thought it was gonna be family friendly. Um, uh, appropriate clothing does not exist no. at this place. <laughs> there were a lot of things that I had to explain to my young children, but uh, <laughs> I won't go there yeah. to include kilts. It's a period piece. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, but we're at the Renaissance Festival and my son asks somebody who's working in one of these archaic weapon shops. Hey, can I shoot that bow? And the guy's like, yeah, sure. We have a little place set up here. Had he not been comfortable enough to ask, he would have never had that opportunity. Well, then my daughter, she's eight. She's like, well, I don't really want to. And I said, okay, well, I'll do it. So I did it. And then she did it. And 
all of us were really, really excited about mm -hmm. trying out this medieval type of bow. And it was just something that was different and potentially a little stupid. Uh, my son threw axes. My son and my husband went and threw axes together. My daughter and I rode an elephant. And so in alignment or a very, it's a very finite definition of the doing stupid, exciting things. But the amount of people I saw just staring at those elephants versus yeah. the experience my daughter and I got to have by sitting on the elephant and filming and doing selfies. And then we started talking about war elf war elephants during the Roman era and it became this big class in education and later we were googling stuff and it's kind of that eight-year-old being willing to jump on the back of an elephant and ride it around in a circle gave her an experience and education she couldn't get anywhere else but if she hadn't seen her mom and her dad yeah. be willing to push past those boundaries on other events maybe she wouldn't have done it yeah. Or, you know, with snowboarding, we've gone snowboarding with the kids and, hey, I want to go a little faster. I want to go a little further. I'm going to try to film my son while going down the mountain. And I'm definitely going to take a digger and I'm probably going to break another rib. But <laughs> wow, the video is so cool as long as it's muted and you can't yeah. hear the curse words. Yeah, it was worth catching that heel edge. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, yes. so you're out there. Have there been any surprising, stupid things that you, you maybe looked at and thought it was ridiculous walking into it? And then you're like, I totally love that. <laughs> not Beyond to mention the renaissance there, yeah. <laughs> right well not to mention a huge one in my entire life i never imagined myself at ranger school yeah. with a bunch of 22 year old young men when i was in my late 30s Ooh. like two weeks before my 38th birthday so that was one of those things it's like oh well that's really dumb sure let's do it oh yeah. my god i i had fun every day i actually have classmates from from my ranger school class that made fun of me because we would be hiking in the mountains and I'd have this huge grin from ear to ear because it was like, this is beautiful. I can't wait to bring my kids back. Um, but that's, that's a big example of, yeah. of stupid, but even like as a, a smaller example, um, two years ago, I quit my job in Houston and decided to move my family to the hill country. And it just, kind of came to me one day my husband's job is really mobile because he owns mm. his own business so he said hey if you if you want to you can and I call it my midlife crisis but I literally quit a great plan paying job with a great pension and 401k and said I want to move to this part of the world and this is really dumb <laughs> I'm giving up so much my family is set here in West Houston, my husband's business is set here in West Houston. And it has by far been the best decision we ever made because in a year and a half, we have a ton of friends, we have a neighborhood, we have that, you know, that middle of nowhere, a hill country type of community yeah. that fits with us. You know, I'm going, going hunting and you know, we basically just stay with friends and we exchange deer meat with our neighbors and <laughs> We give them deer meat and they give us ranch eggs. So it seemed a little stupid at the time. Why give up all this? Everybody kept telling me, nobody quits shell oil. Nobody quits <laughs> this. Nobody walks away from this. And I thought, oh, what am I doing? Well, it's too late now. Let's see what happens. What, what was it then that, that provided that, that break moment? Not necessarily that you were running away from something. It seems like you were running more towards something that you actually wanted. What was it that, that kind of was that break point of go, no go? I felt like, um, I felt like I was a small cog in a huge machine. And I feel like that in the military sometimes, even as a battalion yeah. commander, there's, there's, so many lieutenant colonels, but I feel impactful in the army. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't find in corporate America that I missed in the military is even though I was a senior project engineer and I was uh, climbing the, the ladder, the corporate ladder, I felt like even with another 20 years, I'd never be as impactful as I could be elsewhere. I like the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, I wasn't running away from anything, yeah. but I definitely was running towards this, the small town feel, the, 
hey kids, go play at the park. Um, I want you home when the street lights come on. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what we grew up with. And um, I, di I didn't have that in Houston and I was never going to get it in Houston. That makes sense. So let's rewind a little bit and let's maybe talk to, talk all about this. So you've made all these important decisions and you've been married the entire time that you're, that you're doing so. And it seems like everything's working well. What do those conversations look like when you're when you're saying, "Hey, I want to get out, I'm going to get out of the army," or "Hey, I want to move away from West Houston"? How do you both approach those conversations? You know, it's really complicated because, of course, we're dual military. But yeah. if um, he had a recon battalion command, he's currently a civil affairs group commander. Uh, he outranks me now. We were peers when we got out, <laughs> but he is okay. he does outrank me now. Um, we're both very type A. We're both really driven. We both want to be successful professionally in the military and as parents. So we have to recognize that. And we have to be very aware that um, our priorities could very easily be conflicting. And so in the beginning, we kind of had these conversations of, hey, baby, right now, my career has to take priority. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, at some point in time, my career has to take priority. And we have to treat it almost like a contract where when we sit down for these discussions, you remove all the emotions and, and it's really hard to do when you're married because I don't, I don't know. Are you married? I am. I am. And it's okay. funny that you say that it's a, it's a contract because my wife and I take the same approach and we've gotten hell for it. So. Right. You, but you yeah. have to, because yeah. if, if you go emotionally, then something, something's going to fall to the side mm -hmm. and because emotions are irrational of course yeah. i'm an engineer which means i am not a fair fighter because i do say hey that's irrational yeah. you can't possibly think that way <laughs> um but yeah we definitely have to treat everything a little stoic mm -hmm. and or from a stoic standpoint um and i am really really lucky because i have I always um, joke on social media, hashtag team Jaster, but we really are, before I quit my job, I sat down with the kids, hey, listen, if I quit my job, we're moving and we're either doing it now or we're not doing it at all because mm -hmm. uh, man cub was starting middle school and I didn't want to move him. He plays sports. He's, he's very cerebral. So he's in, you know, some accelerated academic programs. You know, I don't want to be moving him in middle school and high school. So we either do it now or we're not going to do it at all. You guys have to be all in. This is a team decision. If there's one nay vote, you know, we've got mm -hmm. the rest of our flight <laughs> to, to discuss and debate. We'll take another vote at the end and, and see what happens. Um, it, it is very, very regimented decision making. And again, yeah. like I said, though, with Alan's company, him being a principal, and there's three people who own the, his financial advising firm and they, they have some flexibility. So when I said something like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. I just want to move out into the middle of nowhere. He's like, Oh, hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's, let's take a, a step back then. Cause you have all of this stuff on your plate right now. So you've got what you're doing in the reserves. You also have the civil en civil engineering and you're also, mm -hmm running around with the talent war group. Yep. Talk to me about how you just assemble your day-to-day -day life to keep all of this in balance. You know, what's funny is um, we talked a little bit before we went live about what are those weird things you do that don't necessarily make sense, but mm -hmm. they kind of get you through the day. Mm -hmm. And the rule I made is I try not to multitask, but I also try not to compartmentalize. So if I'm at work and personal stuff comes up, I deal with it right then. But that also means if I'm doing personal stuff and work items come up, I deal with it right then as well. So we were in Australia for Thanksgiving in 2019. You know, before COVID, we used to take yeah. vacations. Yeah. And Thanksgiving is a great time because most people don't travel. And since Thanksgiving is a US holiday, um, you don't have to fight crowds in other yeah. countries. So we went to Australia for the Thanksgiving break last year and I brought my work computer with me. And while everybody was sleeping, I logged in and did about an hour of work almost every day. But um, it's, it's the only way for me to find balance. So very contrary to popular belief, I don't 
separate work and life. The only way I can find work-life balance is to let them meld. That being said, I also don't keep one work email open while my, I have my personal email open mm -hmm. and try to multitask because that's ineffective as well. Have there been any like strange resources that got you over the hump to help you achieve that mindset? Or is it something you achieve by trial and error? It was a lot of trial and error, but I would say the resources that got me there were all the different forces pulling on me. Um, my mom is absolutely the most energetic person I ever met. And she was all over the place when I was growing up and I didn't really understand it. But when you're a single mom holding on a full-time job, and my brother and I are, we're a handful <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. And so dealing with the two of us, plus our sports, and we're both into music. Um, we both did acting. Like if there was an event going on at school, we were involved in it. Then she was working full time. Then she was trying to hold down a house and a job or, you know, every, everything else that happens and being a mom. I saw her not be able to compartmentalize. Yeah. She had to go back to work. She had to do something after the kids went to bed. And I thought it was terrible then, but now that I have kids, it's nice to leave work every once in a while at 4.30 so that you don't miss kickoff for yeah. your son's football game. Even though that means you tuck them in, you log into the computer and you make up whatever you might've missed. Um, if it wasn't for all those forces pulling, I don't think I would have been able to figure this out. And it happened over time. You know, you think you're busy when you graduate from college. Mm -hmm. Hell, you think you're busy in college. Then you think you're busy when you get your first job. Then you get married and you're like, oh my God, I used to have so much free time. And then you have your first kid and you're like, wow. And then you throw that second kid in there and you're like, wait a minute. I have no clue what bu busy feels like. And it just, it kind of developed over time, I guess. Gotcha. So when, when you're stepping into the business world, right, and you've obviously, you're in an engineering world and engineers are their own unique dynamic group of people. <laughs> I've, I've spoken with a lot yes, of we them. Are. <laughs> when you were going after to try and increase your, your business acumen and you're in this civil, this new world, what were you doing to kind of learn the ropes as you started out? With regards to business? Yeah. So, um, you mentioned the talent war group. Uh, there's a discussion I'm going to lead in a couple of weeks called uh, leaders or readers. Uh, unless I can figure out a, uh, a better <laughs> title for it. But, um, you know, you could say readers or leaders or leaders or readers, but yeah. leaders really have to be readers. Yeah. And it's fun to look at things through the eyes of my children. So I've got an eight year old. She's just starting to enjoy chapter books and she'll read a book and she'll come back to me. And she's like, mom, did you know Athena was born out of Zeus's head? I'm like you read that in third grade. Awesome. But it, where could you possibly start talking about Greek mythology mm -hmm. if you didn't have books? Right. So for me, a lot of it started off with, with audiobooks. I was commuting 30 to 45 minutes to work. It, of course it was Houston. So that means work was like two miles away, but I was commuting about 45 minutes and it was dead air time. Yeah. And so back when you put a little tape in the tape deck, <laughs> And then later a CD and now, you know, you have the, the right on my phone, um, listening to a book and listening to people, whether it's someone like Mike Sorelli or, um, you know, a, a podcast from an investment group or whatever you have spending that time and starting to just hear different concepts and then, and then try them. And, you know, leadership is one thing. But leadership in business is something completely different because military leadership, you have direct positional authority. And at Shell Oil, I am one of millions. And how do I persuade people who they're in charge of one project, I'm in charge of another project, but they've got a resource I need. How do I work with them? And again, it's, it's learning a lot about business. I read about economics a ton. I had this book called 30 second economics and every two pages was a different economics theory. I have just broken down Barney style. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. It's, and I have an econ degree and it's still one of the best econ books I've ever read. That's awesome. That's awesome. But yeah. So I look in there, I'm like, Oh, okay, well I can, I can coerce Eric into giving me his construction manager for this project because I'm going to rationalize that if we keep so-and-so on the staff, 
as a third party contractor consistently, then he's, it, he's going to want to keep working with us or he's going to yeah. want to maybe apply for a full time position. OK, so I present this to Eric this way from an economics point of view or I start looking at it from a business uh, purview because I have to I have to laterally lead. I have to I have to actually influence people instead of saying I'm the commander. I get to do this because I said so. Yeah. So were there any books you mentioned 30 second economics were there any like pivotal books that you're wow that was eye opening recently there's been a lot more but i'd say uh when i first transitioned from the army to corporate america good to great and i've read it four times since i got out of the army in in 2000 was it 2005 two, wow 2007 <laughs> i got out of the army in 2007 scrolling 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 <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I had, I had a recruiting firm tell me, Hey, this is a really great book for those of you guys who are in the military to kind of cut your teeth on how business works. Mm -hmm. And so I read good to great. I had a battalion commander when I got back in the reserves recommend it. I've actually started buying copies. I'll buy 10 at a time and I give it away to employees and, and peers that I think have a chance to move up the corporate ladder one way or the other, small business or large business, or even start their own business. Mm -hmm. And I would really say good to great, no matter how old that book gets, it's so applicable. And you can't, I haven't figured out a way to argue with it. There's some other ones. Um, my friends that are more into the investing world love rich dad, poor dad, but you can kind of argue some of those points and, and debate it in good to great. I really haven't ever had anybody come back to me and say, yeah, but this was kind of shady or, or this technique doesn't really work. Nobody can argue it. And it's, it's been a great one for me. And then there's a couple other books that just um, help me speak what I'm thinking in a, a much more educated fashion. And it's, um, I don't know if you've heard of Ashley's War. I'm not familiar, no. And it, it has nothing to do with business. But one of the things I learned, um, I learned it in my last duty station in the military in South Korea, and then I relearned it over and over again at Shell Oil Company, um, is the lesson that you have to speak to be heard, not necessarily to speak. So the person on the receiving end has to be able to hear your message. It doesn't really matter how you present it. Um, Shell ended up sending me to a training class and um, there was a couple excerpts from a book called Crucial Conversations. And that's another one that kind of leads into that speak to be heard. What's the point of this discussion? Do I want my husband to take vacation in Australia or do I want to fight with him about where we go on vacation? Okay, mm -hmm. so I have to come in with a persuasive point of view, not a it's my turn to pick where we're going point of view. And um, I say Ashley's War did that for me in a very weird way because it's a real story about one of the first um, CSTs, cultural support teams, uh, one of the first women who did that. And those are the women that were trained up and deployed with various types of special forces units to contact and work with females in Arab nations because there is a male-female divide where the male soldiers or the male Marines, special operators, couldn't talk or interview the females. So they brought military women in to do that role. And there's a line in that book and um, it says, I wanna live in the and. Um, and they were talking about, I wanna wear, I wanna wear mascara and camo. I wanna wear uh, Spanx and cargo pants. <laughs> and it's, it, it's this and. Yeah. And what I loved about that book, again, it's kind of a roundabout way to get to the same thing Crucial Conversation said to me, but it gave me the tools to describe this. Mm. I, I like hunting. I like fishing. I like shooting. I like working construction, but I still want my husband to open the door for me and order <laughs> my dinner. And I yeah. want to live in this weird and, but I never had the words for it. So I read this book. And it described me in a way that I couldn't describe me. So it really opened my eyes to, I guess, a how to look at communication, even though that's not the goal of the book. The goal of the book is to tell, tell a story about this fantastic young soldier. 
Gotcha. So you're, you're talking to me about how, how to describe you. And one thing that I see a lot of veterans struggling with as they get out of the military is literally that question. And in, in a business term, you know, you call it personal branding, call it whatever MBA jargon term you want to use for it. Right. How would you recommend somebody break down that process for themselves to determine who am I and what am I trying to, to pitch here? I think the biggest problem with developing your own personal elevator speech is being realistic on who you are. So I went through a recruiting firm to find my first corporate job after the army and they helped me develop my resume and, and talked me through my brand. What I failed to do is figure out what that was first. Mm -hmm. So when I started interviewing now within, within Shell, I, I worked for Shell Oil for 12 years. Within Shell, every time you change a job, you turn in a resume and you interview for the next position. So you have to, when you're leaving a job, you have to interview for the next job. Or if you're unsuccessful, you might just not be working for Shell anymore. It's not like a lot of other companies where they just move you. And so I actually did have to start figuring out my brand after I was already in this, um, this corporate environment. Mm -hmm. And I did it the wrong way. <laughs> I definitely did it the wrong way. So I had to, I had to fit my personal brand into the existing brand that I had sold myself under. And um, that was really hard to do. And trying to, to cater to what other people think you should look like is where, where we as soldiers or military members, uh, as veterans joining the civilian workforce, completely fail. All right, well, I think I need to be dress this way or talk this way. Well, the truth is I, I was like this before I joined the army. The army just made me a little more of this. Yeah. So if that's who I was 20 years ago, I'm still that way now. I have to admit who I am to myself. So step one of making your personal elevator speech really has to be who am I and where do I want to be? And it always sounds cheesy when people say, hey, where do you see yourself in, self in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? But I never wanted to work as a technical engineer. I love technical engineers, but you keep your AutoCAD and your Bluebeam and all that other stuff on your computer, and I'm going to do something else. I want, I want to help those engineers. Uh, I love the movie Office Space. I know it's super cheesy, but I like to talk to the clients because the engineers can't. <laughs> that is where I want to live. And I couldn't. I couldn't express that and I didn't admit that to myself early enough. So I spent years reviewing design-based documents and working with subcontractors on how to do uh, loop stresses on pressure vessels. And oh my God, even thinking about it now makes me yawn. Like that's not what gets me up in the morning. Yeah. And I failed to admit that to myself. So I couldn't put that out there as a resume. I I am good at conflict management. It is fun when somebody says, Ooh, I have this problem. Ooh, give me five seconds and I will have three solutions for you. And I will go fire that person for you if you need it. <laughs> like that's where I'm, <laughs> that's where I live. And how long did it really take you to get to that point where you're moving from, I'm in somebody else's box that they've made for me to where you can confidently be in your box that you've created. How long did that take? So it took me probably three or four years. And then it took me another six or seven to admit it to other people. I was still not bringing my whole self to work. And when, when you're a leader in the business world, there's no 40 hour work weeks. There's 30 hour work weeks and there's 60 hour work weeks, but there's no 40 hour work weeks. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not bringing your real self to work, if you're not being uh, honest with yourself and the people that you're working with, then you will never be happy and you will never succeed. So I spent probably a total of 10 years being the person that somebody else wanted me to be. Um, again, it only took me a couple of years to realize that I was not bringing my whole self to work, but it took me quite a bit longer to feel unstuck. I felt stuck for a long time. And what were the impacts of that, of that feeling stuck? Cause that's, that certainly isn't unique. I hear a lot of veterans say, you know, describe it as like purgatory or being lost in the desert or stuck in the mud or something. What are the impacts yes. on that uh, across your life 
when you're in that situation? Well, um, I keep all of my smiles for everybody who has to have them. And I figure my husband will be there for me at the end of the day, no matter what. So as with everything else, he caught the raw end of the deal. He got the Lisa comes home and vents for an hour and a half rather than mm -hmm. sitting down, having a glass of wine and watching a movie. Yeah. <laughs> he got to deal with, with the rough stuff. You know, that's, that's part of it. Um, but as with everything that fate has dealt me over the years, it's the best thing that happened to me because as we talked about, again, our connection, the talent war group, I would have no fodder for any of the discussions had I not had those experiences of um, self-conflict, of why can't my managers see this in me? They hired me saying that they wanted somebody who's going to be a leader, but now they have me reviewing documentation. Mm -hmm. Why did they lie to me? Wait a second here, am I doing what I need to do on my end? Like all of that stuff has, it was really painful. It probably caused a lot of stress uh, in my personal life. It did make me super fit because I use my anger with <laughs> the barbell. Yeah. So, so it definitely helped with my workouts. Um, but it also, it also helped me grow quite a bit. And, and kind of what I'm doing now uh, and moving forward is my hope is to share those lessons with other people so that maybe a light bulb goes on and they realize that they're marching in place just like I was, but earlier. And can you talk to me about how you, you package those lessons that you said you have fodder now that you didn't have before, how you package those without also simultaneously pissing off everybody else that you used to work for or used to work with? Yes. Very interesting. Um, I actually keep my kids even know where this document is. I've got, I've got an online document, a Google Docs on my phone that I have tagged. And my kids, while I'm driving, if I think of something like a lesson, they'll open it and they'll type it up and I'll discuss it with the kids. And what we try to do is we try to take the subtleties of the business world, but to describe a frustrating moment I had with Shell Oil Company when I was working unconventional oils in Northern Alberta, would take a little bit more than a 650 word essay. So how can I get it to a platform that everyone understands? And um, oh, I'm trying to remember the quote. It's something about if you can describe it to a third grader, you yeah. truly have mastery of it. Yeah. And um, it's completely gone. Can't, can't find it anywhere in the brain. But I've got a third grader and a seventh grader in my car with me and um, my husband's great, but he's even more cerebral than me. So he might, he might complicate the issue. Yeah. My third grader said the other day, I was talking about a leadership pr principle about trying to get the untalented members of a team more involved. And when I say the non, uh, the untalented or the non, they're those great people that are really hard workers, but mm -hmm. it's not that they're not capable. It's not that they couldn't excel. They just don't want to. Yeah. They're getting close to retirement or, hey, you know what? I don't want to have to work after 5 p.m. I don't want anybody to call me in the evening. Those people who are your, not your talent that you're trying to manage and grow, but the people that are awesome and amazing, well, how do you keep them involved in, in making mission um, mm -hmm. where, yes, they know that they want to leave at 5 o'clock. Everybody knows that they want to leave at 5 o'clock. But until 5 o'clock, how do you utilize them properly? And my kids started talking about, they played basketball in a, kind of a, a fun league this summer. One of those where you have practice and then you have the game immediately afterwards. And it's, you know, an hour, of, hour and a half of basketball, non-competitive, not super competitive one day a week. Mm. And they're like, hey, remember those days that we were just killing other teams? So you kept telling us, you and dad kept telling us to throw the ball to the, the flat-footed runner, you know, the kid that obviously did not grow up as a baller. Um, and, and that kid would shoot and score and shoot and miss and miss and miss and miss and then eventually score again. And that score was more exciting than anything else. Yeah. They're like, Hey, you know, maybe you can talk about that. Maybe your non-developmental employees, sometimes when you have time, you got to pass them the ball a little bit more. So we came, we came through this great discussion we talked for probably 35, 40 minutes in the car on the drive to pole vaulting practice. And the kids wrote the essay of how to properly manage in a company like Shell using summer league basketball. 
and number one, nobody, nobody at Shell definitely read into it too much. Yeah. Um, number two is a great lesson. And number three, if it's a lesson a third grader mm -hmm. can talk you through, then it's probably something that it, one of these short LinkedIn lives, podcasts, blogs, essays might turn on a light bulb for somebody and say, oh my God, I do have that. I have that person. I have that part-time administrative assistant who's there and works hourly and is a great person, but man, they're underutilized. I'm yeah. going to chuck the basketball at them and see if they can make a, make two points. Yeah. No, oh, that's really good. And your kids did all the work, which is even better. Yes. <laughs> even better. Yeah. So let's switch gears for a second. Cause you, you hit on something that I think is very important to a lot of veterans that I see succeeding versus veterans that, that are, that are struggling. You talked about your fitness and specifically harnessing your rage. I'm going to, I'm going to say rage, your rage at work yes. and taking it out on the barbell. What, it, what is it that you're doing when you're, when you're thinking about fitness, how do you approach that question? So fitness for me has always been somewhat of an outlet. Um, but I always had this image that I needed to, as everybody else does, male or female, when people say this is a female issue, I laugh because as somebody who's worked construction, oil and gas in the army, it is not a female issue. It's dudes too. You have this image of what you think your body should look like. You have this image of what you think you should do. You know, we're out hunting on a ranch. I, I picked up two 40 pound uh, feed bags. Somebody looked at me and was like, what the hell? Um, but you know, you think you should be able to do this and you think you shouldn't be able to do that. And so I was stuck in that as well, stuck in that image of, well, I have to be able to squat this much, lift this much, do this much. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it became almost like another stressor. Yeah. And, and what I found is every time I moved, I picked up a different sport, which means I'm always a beginner. And it kind of goes back to the earlier meme, that whole comfort zone thing. Yeah. We moved to New Orleans and I decided I was going to do triathlons and I did up to and including an Ironman. I've ridden that bike twice since <laughs> Ironman, Texas, 2013, like I'm done. But then I started doing CrossFit when we moved yeah. back to Houston. And then I got again, goaded into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And now <laughs> I love that. And I've done a bunch of different activities, but it's become do the activity that you will do. Like fitness doesn't have to be, I'm in the thousand pound club when I'm lifting weights, it has to be, what am I going to actually do every day? And just like with my professional goals, what are my physical goals? At 43 years old, am I going to look like any of the professional 20 something CrossFit athletes? Maybe, but what would I have to give up to get there? Yeah. There would definitely be no Ben and Jerry's. Like... <laughs> That would have to, and, and I'm not okay giving up ice cream. Like yeah. this is a non-negotiable for me. What else would I have to do? Less sleep or more sleep, less time with the kids, less time working, less time having wonderful conversations like this. Like I'd have to give up a lot for that mm -hmm. goal. So um, Team Red, White, and Blue is an organization where the first time we lived in Houston, they kind of wrangled my husband and I, and we did a couple team red, white, and blue runs and events and wad for warriors and just a couple of activities. And that's, that's kind of their motto is community through fitness. And a lot of us as veterans, it seems we either get together to drink beer or to drink coffee. And <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of in between and the beer wasn't really helping me out. And the coffee was during hours that I had to work. So with team red, white, and blue, it was hey, on Saturday, we'll all go for a long bike ride together. And so I found, I actually found a lot of my community through fitness. And, and then I, I reassessed, hey, if I'm always a beginner, then maybe I'm not striving for so many goals. I'm still goal oriented, but I'm not trying to be mm -hmm. a CrossFit Games athlete. I'm not trying to be way up here on some event that I just learned last week. And so I can make it into, it's my time. You know, we left for the ranch pretty early this morning. I got up an hour and a half before everyone else just so I could go. I just had shoulder surgery. So I did physical therapy and then I tested my limits. And yeah. it turns out that even after shoulder surgery, I can do pull-ups and it's super awesome. <laughs> and 
but there we go. Like for, for me, that was a huge break. I don't know that I actually answered your question, but no, no, physical I think, fitness excites me. <laughs> no, that's exactly, I think the point that uh, you made was very valid is that there's no wrong way to fitness and just right. do something that you enjoy that otherwise fits in your life. Would that be a good way to sum that up? Yes, completely. Except for you said it so much better than I did. I just rambled <laughs> I, for 10 minutes. I have the benefit of being on the other side, right? <laughs> I assure you, every time I do an interview, I've, I'm like, oh, did that answer your question? 10 yes. minutes. Oh, it's fine. But then, you know, congratulations on doing a pull-up post-shoulder surgery. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I know you're running out of time and you're out at the ranch and, and I'm grabbing you on a Sunday for... Any veterans that are out there, particularly these professionally ambitious veterans who are stuck kind of like you were, if I had a magic wand and could impart any piece of knowledge into their brain on your behalf, what would that piece of knowledge be? Be true to yourself. Be true to, to yourself and decide what you really want. Um, and then I don't care who you are, you have to be all in. So um, as a female that works, that has kids, that does the reserve thing, I often get questions about um, stay at home moms. Mm -hmm. And, and it's one of my favorite discussions to have, because I think whether you're a working mom or a stay at home mom, it doesn't really matter as long as you're all in and you're true to yourself. Mm -hmm. If you hate staying home with the kids and you hate teaching math and, and doing online learning, not COVID, but yeah. actually <laughs> during, during the real world, how, how we normally live, um, then don't be a stay-at-home mom, you know, just because you think that's what you're supposed to be. And if for guys, don't think you have to be the breadwinner. It's okay to be a stay-at-home dad. It's okay to be, to start something new and be creative, but you have to decide who you really are and be honest with yourself and then be all in on it. And, and that's probably the hardest thing for any individual to do. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Carson. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the Spotlight Podcast. And I just wanted to take a second to ask you who you think should be interviewed on the show. Who do you think is out there that's just absolutely crushing it that the veteran population needs to hear from? That's what we want to hear from you. Send us your suggestions to spotlight at the Zen Veteran. Dot com. That's S-P-O-T-L-I-G-H-T at thezenveteran.com. Thanks again for listening.